it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Side Tunnel by Eric Dodd I hated that town. It's broad across the rotting foothills of a dead mountain chain. The city was a mass of old South racism and corruption, filled with inhabitants too poor or too sentimental to leave for someplace better. The city sweltered in the midsummer heat, smog from traffic mixing with lethal amounts of pollen and dust to form a soup that killed asthmatics as effectively as a whiff of mustard gas. I had acquired a sum of money from a job a few months back, and my needs were modest, so I had nothing better to do than hang out at the fountain downtown or at the coffee shop nearby. I met Charlie first, when I noticed some truly phenomenal photographs on his laptop. They were all of old, beautiful, decayed structures, some of which I'd seen around town. Charlie never made eye contact as he explained in his mild halting speech that he didn't take the photos, those were Jack's, but he handled setting up Jack's website. A few evenings later, I was sitting on the floor of Jack's tiny apartment, drinking beer and talking with a small group of kids that were mostly excited about abandoned and condemned buildings, fire hazards and other signs of urban decay. They called themselves urbexes or urban explorers. The leader of the group was Jack. He was passionate about his photography and was working his art into his college thesis. Jack was tall, with a surface build that could have landed him a contract to model for Abercrombie and Fitch if it weren't for his shock of unruly blonde hair. Jack's girlfriend Annie at first seemed to perform no function aside from looking very good and hanging on to Jack. I asked Charlie about her once and he said that Annie was a very good listener, which is what Jack seemed to want. Shane was huge. He topped 400 pounds, standing well over six feet tall, with thick slabs of muscle overlaid by thicker slabs of fat. He was from some no-name community in the forested hills of middle Alabama, and he dressed as if he was prepping for a deer hunt. For all of his size and massive presence, he was calm and very quiet, perhaps in response to Jack's constant diatribe about the architectural methodologies of whatever. The last member of the group was Petya. She was a transplant from some formerly Soviet bloc country, uprooted from all that she knew, and rudely shoved into the semi-rural Alabama soil, watered a bit and told to deal with it. Lucky for her, Petya was tough as a weed and thrived here. She was short and hard, looking more like a 13-year-old boy than a 19-year-old woman. She discovered country music early after a move, and took to it with a passion that verged on neurotic, to a point that her speech was a heavy southern drawl punctuated with weird Slavic inflections. Jack's obsession with photography, specifically taking pictures of decaying urban structures, well, if given a chance, he'd talk at great and exhausting length about the moral imperative of photographing ruins, as we mowed the original labourers and craftsmen some of our attention to the artisanship of their hard work. Jack had met Charlie in high school, and over the next few years the pair developed their infiltration skills and expanded their group to encompass others with similar interests. Jack seemed to be the idea man, and had an uncanny talent for finding unexplored sites all over the area. Once Jack had located the sites, Charlie would come up with a way to get in. Not only was Charlie an expert locksmith, he'd made friends with many of the librarians and city records keepers in the area. He was often able to provide historical maps and records for the sites. We bounced along a poorly maintained road in Shane's van, listening to Jack crow about our target for the night. Shane didn't appear to be a very smart person, given his size and usual closed mouthedness However, it was his idea to buy a white panel van and affix official-looking State Department of Infrastructure decals to it. He'd mounted yellow bubble lights to the top, and black and yellow caution tape around the bottom. When we stopped, he pulled a few orange traffic cones off of a metal mount on the front of the van and placed them in front and behind it. Isn't that kind of conspicuous? I asked. Shane smiled. Yeah, ain't no damn hooligan kids want to be conspicuous. 
so the van must be here on official business. Ah, oh, here it is, man. Jack clapped me on the back. Holy of holies, the waterworks tunnel. Half a mile straight through a mountain, and Charlie can get us in. I turned and looked at the small metal door set into the side of a hill. Oh, doesn't look like much. I don't think it was that hard to get into. Oh, it's not, Charlie said. But we're going into the side tunnel. Charlie walked around to the rear of the van and pulled out a pickaxe. I wouldn't have been more shocked if he'd pulled out a severed head. As a rule, urbexes greatly disapprove of any actions that change a site. They don't litter, don't do graffiti, and on some message boards there are long-running arguments about even using chalk to mark for wayfinding. Um, what's the side tunnel? I asked. You'll see soon enough, Petya said, handing me a head-mounted flashlight. I grabbed my backpack, which was heavy with gear, snacks, extra flashlights and water bottles. Jack grabbed a shovel from the back of the van and Shane another pickaxe. Moments later, the van was closed and locked, orange cones glowing in the dim light. Charlie produced an actual key to the lock on the metal door and hauled it open. He caught my look and said, uh, Helps to have friends at City Hall. One by one, we walked single file through the door into the waterworks tunnel. Then she closed the metal door with a grunt, and the boom echoed through the darkness. The waterworks tunnel was much like every other tunnel, low, cramped and moist, with an unpleasant smell. Dirt caked the exposed brickwork, and in some places iron piping lay exposed. Ah, uh, like back a hundred years ago when the Don brothers built this thing, there wasn't any good way to get water from the Cahaba River into town, Jack said. So they bought this tunnel right through the mountain, out the other side to where the river is. Well, the side tunnel, though. Oh, please, be quiet, Charlie said. I'm trying to count. We'd been steadily making our way down the tunnel. The darkness before and behind was absolute. I'd been in darker places, but the close confines were beginning to make me anxious. Jack moved away from Charlie, back to me. Anyway, like about halfway through the mountain, the Don brothers got to a spot they really couldn't get through. And they had to bring in heavier machinery, some kind of steam drill rig. You see how tight it is here, man? They dug a tunnel off to the side. Then they expanded it. They were under a deadline, like about to lose their contract. So they made the miners work day and night. They actually set up a small camp in the side tunnel. There were sleeping areas with beds built right into the walls. They even had a small camp store. Well, eventually, the miners got through the tough spot. The dumb brothers just warded up the side tunnel. Nobody's been in there since. Jack's words echoed sibilantly down the tunnel. Well, nobody until us, <laughs> Shane laughed. Oh, it's bullshit, Petya said. There's no such thing as side tunnel. It's Jack being full of the shits again, like with that room under the fountain downtown. Hey, that was real, Annie said. He couldn't get the... Please be quiet, guys, Charlie said again laying his flashlight around the floor and sides of the tunnel. Hey, help me look for an iron valve or gear or something. We all stopped talking then, and began looking around the tunnel. I followed the large iron pipe for a few feet, and then said, Hey, um, is this it? Charlie shone his light on the valve, then on a folded black photocopy of his map. Yeah, that's it. Now, Shane, try that wall right there. Right across from here. You see if it's brick behind that dirt. The pickaxe was incredibly loud in the tunnel. Yeah, good thing there's a mountain between us and anyone that might hear that, I said, holding my hands over my ears. Petya smirked and handed out ear covers from her backpack. Shane bashed the wall with the pickaxe a few times more, then scraped at it with the side of the axe. Yeah, there's concrete over brick right here. Shane said, pulling a crumbling red brick loose with his pick. Jack eagerly grabbed the sledgehammer. 
He and I took up positions on either side of Shane. We began to hammer away at small spots on the wall. Several minutes later, Jack's sledge punched through the wall a few feet farther down the tunnel. Hey, uh, I'm through, Jack yelled. Come here, help me. Shane and I moved near him, breaking the hundred-year-old brickwork and he made a few feeble attempts at moving bricks out of the way until Petya shoved her aside. "Ah, You might break a nail, Petya growled, and began stacking the rubble into two careful piles on either side of the widening hole in the wall. Charlie donned gloves and helped, and soon we stood before a small hole that appeared to open into a larger chamber. Charlie handed Jack the large spotlight. Yeah, after you, sir. Charlie said, bowing slightly and extending his arm towards the hole in the wall. Jack grinned and ducked into the hole, followed by Annie, Charlie, Shane, Petya, and finally me. From the other side, the bricked-over section was much larger than the small opening we'd made, nearly six yards across. There were a few wooden crates stacked on the sides of the tunnel, covered by dirt and dust-covered tarpaulins. The tunnel was narrow at first, but seemed to widen at some distance away. Its walls receded into the gloom, out of the reach of the small bright beam of light cast by Jack's spotlight. Jack moved the light around slowly, illuminating the side tunnel for the first time in over a hundred years. Yeah, uh, how big was this tunnel supposed to be? I asked. According to the map... Maybe 30 feet wide and 200 feet long, Charlie said. Well, it's a hell of a lot bigger than that, said Shane, staring off into the darkness. I think it gets a lot wider down there. Okay, guys, let's get what we came for, Jack said. Annie, hand me my camera back. We need to document this as we go through it, so we can have photos of the tunnel in its pristine state. As Jack set up his photography gear, we dispersed, each of us shining lights around the first part of the tunnel. I noted to myself that none of the group seemed particularly willing to go farther down the tunnel. Jack began snapping photos, the flash flaring like lightning. Hey, guys, look at this, Shane called from farther down the tunnel. The light from his flashlight made him seem small in the darkness, and his voice echoed strangely. Charlie, Petya, and I walked down the tunnel to where Shane stood. Hey, this isn't supposed to be here, Charlie whispered. I'd heard that line before. Hell, I've said it before. Suddenly, I was gripped with a panicky certainty that I should leave. Drop my pack, ditch these fools, and run all the way to the doorway in the mountainside. Open it and keep running. Hey, maybe all the way to the ocean, even. I shuddered once, swallowed, and pushed this thought down. I had a job to do. Shane was standing in front of the first building of what seemed to be an abandoned town. I counted over eight buildings on either side of a smooth dirt street extending down the tunnel. The buildings were rudely finished, with unpainted grey boards cracked and warped with age, but mostly whole. The cavern in which they stood was quite large, but the roof was low enough to see by flashlight. Jeez, Jack said, startling all of us. Quit that asshole, Petya growled, punching Jack in the arm. You scared the shit out of me, standing in scary tunnel with Ghost Town. She got closer to him, with a finger in his face. You are full of shit again, Jack. You set this up to pull prank on this new guy, yes? You all knew this was down here. Jack backed up a step then. Hey man, back off. We had no idea this was down here. I mean, seriously? We had to break through a damn wall. How could we have known this place was even down here? Well, the news articles I found did say they built a camp for the miners, Charlie said. This whole area was sealed up till we knocked a hole in the wall. Seems pretty dry down here, so the buildings are basically mummified. Betcha rolled her eyes. Oh, 
is exactly what we need. Mommy buildings. She slugged Jack on the arm again, and then stomped off. Yeah, camp, Charlie, Jane said. This ain't a camp. This is a whole town. There's what? A dozen old buildings down here? I want to get out of here, Jack. Take me back to the van, Annie said, and then leaned on Jack in such a way as to press many exciting parts against him. Betcha rolled her eyes. We are not going back now, Annie. We just got here. If Jack is right, we are first. We are never first at anything. That seemed to steal Jack's resolve. Yeah, she's right, Annie. This is the type of thing that lands me a National Geographic deal. Charlie then glanced back at Jack. Us, Jack. All of us. Yeah, of course, man. We'll all be famous. Now, let's get a shot of that building there, Jack said, with a distracted look that indicated he was no longer thinking about the current conversation. Annie and Shane cautiously investigated the shack on the opposite side of the tunnel. Betty and I walked down the tunnel, past the first few buildings, to a larger clearing. The center of the clearing had a large stack of ancient, mostly burned wood in a circular fire pit. A few rusted metal cans lay scattered around the pit. To the left and right of this pit, tunnels extended and disappeared into the darkness. I'd done my research for months, looking in the basements of dusty college libraries and used bookstores, scouring thrift stores, yard sales, and once I got to Birmingham, reading the papers, looking for reports of the missing. I had more doubts than clues, with only the scars upon my face as evidence that the thing that I sought was real, and not a paranoid fantasy of my own making. I knew I was in the right place when I saw what lay in front of us. Part 2 At the end of the side tunnel, carved into the raw rock wall like some hillbilly Petra, rose the face of a large building that could only be a church. The carvings had a crude look to them, columns and lintels hammered out of the stone with miners' chisels by men who might have seen a drawing of a Roman column in a newsprint. Crosses decorated the facing at various points, but my eyes were immediately drawn to the symbol above the only door. I recognize the symbol's loops and angles, but only in reverse, as I have only seen it on one other place, my own mirror. There's a faint white tracery only visible now under the bright glare of the light reflecting off the scarred skin of my forehead. At that moment of recognition, as if in sympathy, my scars began to itch. Faintly, but the itch was there, a subtle warning. Get out. I knew I should listen, but it had taken so long to catch the faintest trace of this trail that... Oh. Hey, look, a cave. I wonder what's inside, Petya said with a knowing smirk. She shouldered her pack and walked into the doorway. I had no choice but to follow her. The doorway opened into a small, low tunnel carved out of solid rock. After a few feet, the tunnel turned sharply left, and turned again to the right, then opened into a larger room with a downward sloping floor. The remnants of wooden pews sat rotting silently on either side of the narrow aisle leading down to the front of the room. At the front, a few large leather sacks leaned against a round structure that appeared to be an altar. As we moved closer, Petra let out a stifled squeak and stopped. She glanced at me, but I already knew. The leather sacks were in fact the desiccated remains of three people, hunched, headless, and kneeling at the altar. I stepped closer. What I'd originally thought of as an altar was in fact a pit or a deep well, its bottom hidden far below. Bodies, Petya said. A sidelong glance at her face showed me the shocks bruised look about her eyes. She grimaced and then shouldered her pack. 
Jack will not be happy about this. Indeed, Urbexes hate finding bodies. At the least, bodies are creepy and unpleasant, and at the worst, they can entangle a crew in months of police investigations, red tape, and possible trespassing charges. Yeah, let's try to steer Jack away from this for now, I said. In fact, let's head back. Petcher nodded, and we left the church, Petcher glancing over her shoulder at that well. When we arrived back at the clearing, Jack was missing. Well, Annie was furious, eyes rubbed red and raw, berating Charlie and Shane. That's rule number one, Shane. Stick with your buddy. You guys act like I'm just eye candy. Treat me like I'm Jack's Barbie doll who can't do anything. But I've been on more crawls than either of you two in the last year. Where were you, Shane? What were you doing? Shane stared at the ground scuffing the dirt floor of the tunnel with his work boots. We were... We were just... We were making out, Charlie said. It happens. And he whirled on Charlie. Oh, for Christ's sake, Charlie. Couldn't you have kept your hands in your pants for an hour? Both have jobs to do. Well, same goes for you, Annie. Where were you and what were you doing? You've been stuck up Jack's ass all night, so we figured he'd be fine, Charlie said. In the glow of the flashlights, Charlie glanced at Petra and I and blushed. Oh, look, this isn't helping. We need to find Jack. Couldn't have gotten far. Probably down the tunnel, taking pictures. Yeah, you know how he gets when he's found a good subject. We then spread out. Annie ran to the entrance, but saw no sign of Jack. I checked a few of the wooden structures, but found nothing. When we reached the end of the side tunnel, in front of the church, Charlie wanted to check inside. Oh, Petra and I just came from inside there, I said. I glanced over at Petra, who shook her head. She knew as well as I that the revelation of the three mummified corpses in the church would send the rest of the crew into a panic. If you want... I'll run in and check. You go and look in these other buildings, and I'll be right back. Charlie rounded up the others and walked down the tunnel to the right, calling Jack's name as they went. I turned and walked back into the church. As I followed the tunnel's turns, I noticed light shining from the well room. Dreading what I'd find, I walked into the small room and found it as Petcher and I had left it. Empty, save for the three mummified bodies clustered around the well, and Jack's large spotlight positioned at the top of the well. Well, she, Jane said, in that peculiarly southern way that splits a single-syllable word into seven or eight more syllables. He peered into the well, but his flashlight was unable to pierce the gloom at the bottom. <sighs> Looks like Jack's exploring without us, I said. We should probably go down after him. Oh, don't think that's a good idea, man, Charlie said. He was visibly shaken. Well, the whole group was. The three headless, mummified corpses squatting near the well did not help ease the tension in the room, and the group was decidedly angry at Petra and I for not mentioning them before. You're going to go in there after him, Charlie, Annie said. You owe it to him. If you're too pussy to go in, then I'll go. We all go, Petya said. I have seen the scary movies. We don't split up. Splitting up is when monsters get us. She shoved Shane out of the way, adjusted her headlamp, and began the descent. Annie followed, then Shane, and then Charlie. I climbed down the shaft after all the others, leaving that strange church in near darkness illuminated only by the cold green glow of a few long-duration chem lights left at the top of the well. I've been lost in the dark before, and a little extra light can make all the difference. The tunnel at the bottom of the well smelled like blood. The others noticed it, and so Charlie began some tentative explanation about the amount of iron ore in the walls, but then trailed off. They could sense the wrongness of this place. 
Under the pervasive smell of rust and blood, there was another, fouler stink. Not so much a scent, but the memory of a scent, a recollection of the odour of something horrible that once passed this way and might yet come again. When we reached the first intersection, Charlie asked us to stop. He fished around in his backpack and pulled out a can of highly reflective spray paint. Charlie, Jane said, Urbexes don't leave traces. Worst case, they use chalk, because it washes away with water. They don't spray paint anything. Fuck this place, man. Charlie popped the top, shook the can, and sprayed a large arrow on the tunnel wall, pointing back to the well. Yeah, fuck it in the rear. Petya startled us all with her cackled laughter. Ah, in ear, good one, Charlie. That set the rest of the group off, and for a time eased the growing sense of fear. We turned to the right and followed the new tunnel, periodically calling for Jack. The tunnel forked, split, then forked again. Oh, there's miles of tunnels down here, Shane said. How are we going to find Jack in all of this? He's not leaving any markers, and the floor's too hard to see his footprints. Uh, we'll find him, Charlie said. These tunnels have to go somewhere. What I'd like to know is why they're here. When at first I thought this was a coal mine, there's no bracing like I expected, so I thought maybe it was a saltpeter mine. That'd explain the lack of bracing and the crazy tunnels, but I haven't seen neither on these walls. None of this makes any sense. Annie, who'd been quiet for a while, stopped. Guys, I saw someone up ahead. Jack, she yelled and ran forward. We followed, running in a stooped half-run so as not to hit our heads on the low tunnel ceilings. Annie called for Jack as she ran, gradually outdistancing us with her frantic pace. Up ahead in the gloom, we saw a pause, turn our head to the left, then lunged down a tunnel branch. Hey, Annie, slow down, Shane yelled. Even though the air was cool in the tunnels, sweat beaded his face. We heard a thin shriek then, followed by sobs. Annie, Shane yelled again. We found Annie sitting on the floor of a room, the first of its size that we'd encountered. The floor was hard-packed earth, like the rest of the tunnels, but there were a few old wooden boards scattered around. Her pack was open in front of her, and she was muttering a quiet stream of obscenities. She'd removed a boot and was wrapping her foot in gauze from a first aid kit. Sorry, guys. I tripped over a damn board. Guess I was going too fast and wasn't watching where I was going. Jane and Charlie hurried over to her, clucking like upset hands. Charlie pronounced Annie's ankle to be sprained. I guess we should uh, take a rest break, Shane said. At what time is it? About three in the morning, Charlie replied, looking at his watch. Feels like we've been down here for hours. We should go back, Petya said. And Annie shook her head firmly. No, I'm not leaving without Jack. Look, Annie, I know you thought you saw him, Shane said. But we don't even know if he's down here, Charlie replied. Yeah, yeah, he is. We saw a spotlight at the top of the well, Annie said. I know, but that's just it, pointed out Charlie, taking a bite of a protein bar. Jack's a pro. He wouldn't come down here without us. I've been thinking... What if we have it all wrong? What if he left the spotlight behind while he went to fight us? We maybe somehow missed him. Oh my God, said Annie. I bet he's terrified. Someone needs to go back and leave a note or something. As she climbed to her feet, her ankle turned and Shane and Charlie both caught her. Oh, you're definitely done exploring, said Shane. Okay, I'll take Annie back to the van. We'll leave notes for Jack along the way. And Charlie? Jane looked down. I 
think it's time to call the cops. Charlie blew out a compressed breath. <sighs> Jack is going to be pissed. Yeah, he will, but he shouldn't have run off like this. There's bodies down here, and we have an injury. You want to keep going on these field trips, we better play by the rules. Give us three more hours, Shane, I said. If we can't find Jack by dawn, no problem. We'll pack up and head to the entrance, and we'll call the cops. But I think we'll find it before then. And call Roberto, Charlie said. Shane tightened his jaw at this. Roberto was Shane's ex, and they'd had a bad breakup. But Roberto was a long-term detective on the city's police force, and could smooth things over for the group. I know you're still pissed at him, but we need his help. Shane helped Annie up, leaned on him as they staggered out of the room. I could tell from the set of Shane's jaw that he was pissed, but I knew Annie would make him call the cops. So, I had three hours, maybe less. I hoped it would be enough time. I knew I might be able to break back into the side tunnel in another month or so, my guess was that the site was about to become very popular with a lot of different people. Oh, I clenched my fists. I was very close. Closer than I'd ever really been. I wasn't about to let this opportunity slip away. I stood up, dusted off my jeans, and gathered the few items I'd pulled from my pack. Right, time to go find Jack. There's a lot of branching tunnels down here, so remember to mark them, Charlie. I think we missed a few when we were running after Annie. I turned to Petya. You're the best mapper we have. Do you have any idea of where we are? Yep, Petya said. We're about half a kilometer from the well. Pretty much straight line from there. Plenty of places for Jack to be. I say we do maze logic. Pick right-hand wall and follow it until it ends or loops back. We go for 90 minutes. If no Jack, we head back to well. Surely we'll find him before then, Charlie said. It's after three in the morning. He's got to be tired. Couldn't possibly be anything that interesting. Charlie stopped. Turned his head. And then I heard the scream. Part three. Mentally, I was prepared for this. I knew that I had made a conscious decision to lead these kids into a trap and to use them as bait. I rationalized that by putting a few people at risk, I would ultimately be protecting many more. I knew that was just rationalization, though. In truth, I didn't feel guilty about putting my friends in danger. I felt guilty about not caring about them at all, when endangering them put me closer to my goal. Annie, Charlie yelled. We ran out of the room and down a tunnel towards the sound of her voice. I saw her first, lurching against the tunnel wall, dragging her injured foot, eyes deep-socketed and huge in the bleached white mask of her face. Her shirt was splattered with a spray of blood. Shane, she said. It, it got Shane. What got Shane? Petya asked. I don't know. We're close to the well. Shane kept saying he heard something walking behind us. When we looked, there was nothing there. So we kept walking. And then, there was something there. And it took him. Her face crumpled in grief. Just pulled him right out of my hands. I don't... I don't, I don't know if he knew what happened. His face... He just looked so confused. Petya took Annie's hand, and Annie clung to her, sobbing. I knelt with my pack on the tunnel floor and rummaged through it. When Charlie saw the gun, he stepped back a pace. Jeez, fuck. What the hell is that thing? It's a shotgun revolver. Six chambers all loaded. If you have to use it, be really careful. It's got no uh, safety to speak of. Well, the gun scared the shit out of me. It was huge, making Dirty Harry's Magnum look like a squirt gun. 
was heavy and unwieldy and hurt like a bastard to fire. But it was shorter than a shotgun and took shot shells, which was useful as I'd hand loaded every shell. I had no idea what might kill or even hurt the thing that I hunted, but I had my hopes. Buckshot mixed with either rock salt, silver shot, gold shot, mercury, garlic, or finally, communion wafers and holy water. And if that didn't work, I had some hollow point solid rounds that I could use on myself if it came to it. I pulled out two long hunting knives that I had hand silvered. Why would I have to use it? Charlie asked, pushing his glasses up and blinking rapidly. In case the thing down here, with us, gets me before it gets you. I handed the two knives to Charlie and Petcha. Be careful with those two, they're sharp. I electroplated them myself. Will they work? Petcha asked. I have no idea, I replied. I picked most of this stuff up by watching Supernatural reruns. I'm making the rest up as I go along. We are so fucked, Petya said, and shook her head. Look, I think they'll work. Worst case, it'll drive the thing off for long enough that we can get away. Annie, who'd been very quiet, looked up at me. You knew. She lunged forward and punched me hard in the side of my face. I fell back and cracked my head on the tunnel wall. You knew. You knew something was down here, you bastard. You let us all down here as- Bait, Petya said, and sighed. She looked up from her near crouch and eyed me with contempt. I got up, rubbing my throbbing head. Look, I've been hunting this thing for a long time. It's killed people and- And it's my fault. I let it out so it's my responsibility to take it down. And you're the one with the gun, Charlie said. Right. I'm the best chance any of you have of living through this, and I think that if there's anyone with a chance of hurting this thing, it's me. I stood up, put the gun into a holster, put two moon clips each into my jacket pockets. I shouldered my pack. Let's go. Annie... Take us back to where I got Shane. Everyone, stay behind me. Pulled out the gun again, we started walking back down the tunnel toward the well. Now the trek back was far worse. Charlie's markers glittered like cat's eyes in the distant gloom, and we all kept seeing shadows at the corners of our vision. Twice I nearly wasted ammo on a slight imperfection in the tunnel wall. The weight and bulk of the shotgun pistol made it extremely uncomfortable to carry for any length of time, so I eventually settled for keeping it in the holster, pulling it out any time I thought I saw something. We could see the handholds of the wall when we reached the area where Shane was taken. There was a great deal of blood splashed on the wall, and more trailed off down a tunnel that forked off from the main one. There's the well, I said. You three take the knives. Climb up and get out of here. Call for help. I'm going after the thing that got Shane. I'm not leaving without Jack, Petya said. She looked at Annie and then looked away. Then I remember the way Petya looked at Jack when she thought nobody was looking at her. <sighs> Fair enough. I think we all know that Jack's not... <sighs> Jack didn't make it, Charlie said wiping his eyes. But I'm not going without Shane, or at least finding out what happened to him. He turned away then, weeping silently. We're coming with you, Annie said. I'm not leaving without Jack either, or at least without knowing what happened to him. Like Petya said, we don't split up. You saw what happened to me and Shane when we went off on our own. I looked at all of the blood on the ground. Nobody knows we're down here. They might find the van, but they won't find the entrance to the side town. I've been in this type of situation before. Things change when the cops show up. There'll be a cave-in, or a flood. All the cops will walk all the way down the length of the waterworks tunnel, and they simply won't see the hole we made. Because they can't. 
or because they really don't want to. If you follow me, well, I'm probably not going to survive this, so you won't either. Nani took a step closer to me and shook a fist in my face. You can't get off your white knight hero horse now, asshole. She grabbed my collar and began to punctuate her sentences by shaking my head. Find my boyfriend now. I stepped back against the wall and pushed her away. Okay, fine. So be it. We followed the spatters and smears of blood down a long tunnel that snaked and twisted and sloped downwards, gently at first, and then more steeply. My scars had been itching faintly since I climbed down the well, but the itching had increased to a shrill, insistent whine against the nerve endings of my skin. I could feel the looping scrawl of each scar, so faint as to be invisible in daylight, etched into my face as if held in place by a net of white-hot wires. The air in the tunnel began to thicken with moisture, the walls shining wetly in the reflected beams of our lights. I stopped, holding up a hand to warn the others. I, I see light from up ahead, I whispered. Somewhere down the tunnel, a pale golden light flickered. I pulled the revolver from its holster, cursing its weight for the hundredth time. We continued down the corridor, cautiously and slowly, partly due to fear and partly due to the floor, which was very steep and slick with moisture. The tunnel ended abruptly at a thin ledge that bordered a space, wide and open and chaotic with shapes. First, I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing, the lines and forms overlapping and merging, like looking skyward at the moon through an ancient tree. We all stood on that ledge for a moment, gasping, maybe making some small sounds as our minds fought to process that view. Gradually, my eyes traced the subtle lines and edges of structures, clustered against the walls in claustrophobic clots and knots, like a type of architectural tumour. The walls of the cavern receded out and away, plunging down into mist-shrouded depths, fading from my view. The structures were lit from indeterminate light sources, lined in a dim gold light that did more to cast shadow than to reveal. As I stared, I began to notice the crumbled ledges, the blank and open entryways, the empty areas on distant walls where whole sections of the buildings had sloughed off and fallen into the pit far below. I noticed the stillness, the silence of the place. It's a city, Charlie said. A dead city, I replied. How can it be a city? Annie asked. There's no streets. Those doors open out onto thin air. That makes no sense. Well, it makes perfect sense if you have wings, I said. I gestured at a brighter area down the ledge to our right. That's where we're going. The ledge was smooth, its surface glassy but not slick seemed to emit a faint gold light that was only visible from the corner of my vision. We crept down the ledge for a few hundred yards, reaching a wide platform. Against one low wall was a large seat of sorts, and in front of that seat was a long, rounded metallic table. Shane's corpse glistened wetly on the table. Chest cracked open, ribs splayed wide like two open skeletal hands. The top of his skull had been removed, and a mass of black tubes snaked from the opening down to the table. No! Oh, Charlie wailed and ran to the table. Charlie, don't! I yelled. Charlie reached the table and stopped. He reached out an arm and gently touched Shane's bloody face. Shane's eyes snapped open. I could see his lungs flutter in the raw cavity of his chest. His mouth worked silently, lips pulled back in a rictus grin, tongue thrusting against his teeth. His body began to twitch and spasm, and then the black tubes penetrating his skull writhed and pulled taut, and the spasm ceased. Shane's eyes rolled up in its sockets, and his eyelids closed, almost peacefully. 
Charlie whirled to face me, face contorted with rage and grief, silver hunting knife held in the murderous grip in his hand. What did this? What the fuck did this to him? Part 4 As if in answer to his question, the thing hit him so fast it was a blur. Charlie let out a brief scream as he was hooked high up into the air, then screamed again in rage. I saw Charlie plunge the knife deep into the thing's abdomen, pull it out and plunge it in again. The thing let out an ear-splitting shriek and let Charlie go. Annie, Petcher and I watched as Charlie fell, tumbling over and over into the depths. The thing crashed to the floor and skidded to a stop against the cavern wall. Shoot it, Annie yelled. Kill it now. The creature stood as I raised the gun with two shaking hands. Oh, the thing was huge, standing over twelve feet high took a staggering step forward on curiously back-bent legs, and then another. It shuddered. I could see a milky, iridescent fluid seeping out of a wound in its belly. Its head snapped up and forward, and its eyes, oh, there were so many, were focused on me. I felt a disorienting tilt in my perspective, as if I was seeing myself, and the room, and Petya, and Annie, and the creature all at once. I felt a curiously mechanical ticking. I felt that the size of the thing was a mistake. It was much, much larger than it actually appeared. The creature spread its wings, two or four or six, feathered and broad and black and leathery, tipped with hooks and talons, and flapped them all at once. The scent billowed over us all, the scent we'd smelled in the tunnels, acrid and dry like oranges rotting in the desert sun. It came closer to us, and I felt it outside my mind, a pressure that was immense and cold and horribly, inhumanly logical. I waited, even though I could still hear Annie and Petya screaming behind me, screaming for me to shoot this thing. My scars were now twisting and rippling on my skin, white hot and reaching a point so far beyond pain I could not name it. I focused on that sensation and steadied my aim. The gunshot thundered deafeningly loud in the silence of this dead city. The shotgun revolver kicked viciously in my fist and I nearly dropped it. The creature had closed nearly half the distance between us. It stopped and some of its eyes seemed to blink. One of its wings seemed to droop. I saw that my first round of rock salt and buckshot had punctured a small, ragged hole through its leathery membrane. I braced myself and fired again. The creature recoiled with a scream as the silver shot ripped open a jagged swath across its chest. I fired once more and was rewarded with another scream. It was so close that its stink was suffocating now. I fired again and again. The thing reaching out for me with so many arms, its wings fluttering so fast they were a blur. And then, it had me. Two of its arms clutched me around the waist and pulled me up close. Two more arms reached up with taloned hands, black and scaly, crusted with impossible jewellery, and clasped both sides of my face. I turned my head from side to side, almost gently, and then looked deeply into my eyes. Of the many things I saw in those huge golden orbs, with their rings within whirling and spinning rings, the worst was recognition. The pressure outside my mind intensified, and I felt a snap, like a green stick fracture from a short, sharp fall, and it came flooding through. It spoke to me then, not in words, but in a purer, an older form of communication. Thank me for bringing it more meals, and thank me even for bringing it information about the world from which it had been away for so very long. It promised that I was its favourite, and I'd be rewarded in some incomprehensible, impossible way. 
I felt a deep and loathsome love welling up in me for this thing, as a dog would unconditionally love its master. Then the creature screamed, shrieking in real pain, and it was gone from my mind. I felt it recede like a tide, and missed that presence, hating myself for feeling so. I fell to the ground in a heap as the creature stepped back, arms raised to its head. Fetcher had leaped upon the creature's back and was stabbing her long, silvered knife deep into the creature's eyes. The thing scrabbled its many taloned hands at her, leaving deep scratches on her arms, but she dodged and kept plunging the knife into the thing's eyes. Finally, with a deep guttural bellow, she slammed the knife with both fists deep into the center of the creature's skull. The wings stopped fluttering, and the thing toppled forward to the floor. Petya untangled herself from the thing's bulk and half stumbled to where I was sitting. Her face was ashen, and she held one arm with the other, blood oozing from long scratches on both. Annie shook herself and ran to Petya, dropped her backpack and pulled out the first aid kit. Neither of them looked at Shane. Once Annie had bound the worst of Petya's wounds, Petya stood up and walked over to the still form of the fallen creature. She kicked it, savagely, once in the head. She stooped to remove the knife. Leave it, I said. She turned to look at me. I think it's better off where it is. It's dead. I killed it, she said. Well, for now. But it might not be later. And that knife might postpone later for long enough. It's time to go. Annie gestured at Shane's body. What about him? We can't leave him here. I know we can't, I said. But none of us have the strength to carry him out. And we don't know if that thing is going to wake back up. Or if there's more of them. Well, that seemed to motivate Annie and Petya. Annie packed up her first aid kit. And we left the dead city by way of the tunnel from which we'd entered. I thought I saw the dim, golden light growing fainter as we left, and that made me feel a slight bit of hope. The walk back to the well was long, far longer than I'd remembered. The lower tunnel floors were sloped upwards, and they were slick. Annie and I both fell at least twice, which did nothing to improve my headache or Annie's sprained ankle. Petya had lost a shoe in the fight, and had kicked off the other one before leaving the cavern. I thought about that shoe a lot while walking out of those tunnels. I wondered what some future explorer would think upon discovering that platform in a dead city of angels, and on that platform, the creature's corpse and a single shoe. When we reached the well, I realized something had changed. I could see light at the top, much brighter than the few chem lights I'd left behind. Annie saw the light and began to shout for help. A familiar voice sounded down from the top of the well, and a silhouette of a head blocked the light. Annie, what are you doing down there? Jack yelled. After much hugging and crying and kissing and a fair amount of punching, we got out of the well and back to the entrance of the side tunnel. Bet she was unable to climb due to her injured arm. Jack and I helped to get her out of the well, using a Swiss seat that he'd fashioned out of grappling. Annie was able to climb out of the well on her own, putting minimal weight on her injured foot. According to Jack, he left his spotlight at the edge of the well as a light source for some incredibly amazing photographs. Midway through, the cheap Zeiss lens somehow fell off of his camera and shattered on the stone floor. In a panic, he ran to the tunnel entrance to find a replacement, only to realize he'd left his case of spares back at the van. Thinking he wouldn't be long, he ducked out into the waterworks tunnel and ran back to the van. Yeah, man, Jack said. That was totally stupid, guys. I was dark and I was in a hurry to get back. So, like, I got my spare case and shut the back doors and locked the van. Then, like, I ran around the side of the van. You know those big mirrors on that thing? Well, they stuck out three or four feet either side. Yeah. Cluck myself big time on one of those. I think it tore off the mount. Anyway, it knocked me completely unconscious. 
Woke up maybe a half hour ago, and with a killer headache. My body was all bloody. It was light outside. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I got my shit together and came back down here, but I couldn't find you guys. Jeez, it's spooky as shit down here when you're alone. I was about to freak out until I heard some noises coming from the well. Man, I was really going to freak out. He paused to take a breath and a sip of water from a bottle. Oh man, Shane's going to be pissed when he sees what I did to the van. Hey, where is Shane? Where's Charlie? Jack wanted to go back immediately. Neither Annie nor Petya would allow it. He swore he was going to get a group of people together to find Shane and Charlie, or at least their bodies. He said he'd call in every favor he was owed, do whatever it took. His first call would be to Shane's brothers, both of whom were even larger than Shane, and both of whom owned enough firepower to take over a small country. Well, I agreed and promised to help, but I was already planning to slip away as soon as I could. Jack's search party might find the side tunnel, but the entrance would be collapsed. All the tunnel would be there, and even the building inside, but the well would be full of dirt, or simply missing. No, no amount of drilling, or explosives, or ground-penetrating radar would ever uncover that dead city. Annie and Petcha both hugged me, to my surprise, as we stood in the parking lot across from Jack's apartment. I shook Jack's hand and promised to call him after I got some rest. Put my gear into the trunk of my old battered blue Toyota Corolla. As I was driving away, Annie embraced Jack again. His eyes caught mine over her shoulder. Then one lid drooped in a slow, lurid wink. And in that moment, in the late morning light, the other eye flashed gold like gold rings spinning inside gold rings. And then it was gone. Well, it could have just been the trick of the light, I suppose. Well, I don't know about you, but I do really love these Urbex stories. Um, Something really cool about them. Um, Everything that should be normal but just isn't quite, and takes you unexpected into different places. And, oh, what am I talking about? Anyway, <laughs> something about these kind of stories, I really enjoyed um, reading them to you. Yeah, I've done a bit of urbex around here, um, hoping to incorporate it into my video, uh, you know, the visuals that I use. So I'll let you know as and when I do that. Well, that's quite a good long story for your Monday evening's entertainment, and I will be back again very soon. <laughs> Till the next time, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me, and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon, if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.